Well, thank you so much to all of you for the remarkable work you do and for coming to see whether you're in engineering, arts and science, the School of Medicine, Blair, the remarkable work that our colleagues do and sharing with them the joy we have in celebrating these careers and these achievements. It's not my opportunity to say a few words as uh, I am uh, obliged and privileged to do at the beginning of the academic year. Um, the new and old rituals that mark the beginning of an academic year, however, never feel repetitive to me, even as my years at Vanderbilt pass. I remember coming to my very first faculty assembly. I am now proud and honored to be your new chancellor. But I've been in my 22nd year as your faculty colleague. In my early years, the arrival of new students, we called them, of course, one else. The posting of the first day's assignment, lengthy, tedious, difficult, expecting them to be fully prepared, encouraging my new colleagues as they began teaching classes at Vanderbilt. They all focused me, energized me on the year ahead. And most importantly for me, they focused me and defined for me that I was part of a distinctive community. I was at an academic institution of extraordinary quality and unbounded aspirations with a unique mission of teaching and research, both at the highest level. Sure, there was work to be done and a salary received for this work. But for me, and as I look out on our colleagues, I know it is true for all of us, my work from my earliest days was very much my life. It was very much my identity. To be a professor at Vanderbilt, even an assistant professor, meant hopefully a good salary, a decent office, and of course the certainty of bad parking. <laughs> but my sense of self, my sense of my calling, my belief was for all our challenges, there was no better life than being a professor. I was a professor not to make a living. Like all of you, I lived and lived to be a professor. The standard invocation to me read repeatedly in hiring, tenure, promotion files, research, teaching, and service is no mere boilerplate, but a noble and unique call for all of us. Clearly, my beginning of the year traditions have changed but no decent university administrator, and I hope certainly no president or chancellor presiding over these great universities, while reading, of course, the financial reports at the end of the year as classes start. As I'm getting ready, like so many other presidents and chancellors, for board committees, my first board audit committee this year. Also preparing for freshman movement, speaking to new parents, and performing the other meaningful acts of rooting in the new into these historic, indeed almost ancient institutions called universities. One ought not forget those personal and professional origins. I would go further and say that there's also almost, and I feel it every year, a sense of loss, or even for a longing for the engagement in those simple but defining professional professorial guideposts of research, teaching, and service. For this and so many other reasons, as we open this new year, as I have the privilege to speak to you, I cherish my opportunity to speak to my colleagues and my friends twice a year. It doesn't have the small size or, frankly, the opportunity for academic engagement that I hope you know from my meetings I enjoy so much. But it allows me an opportunity to speak about our university its core values, our great progress to work ahead, and certainly the challenges that loom. I do so humbly knowing that my work, my job is very much defined and inspired by your ideas, your dreams of what we can achieve as one of the world's greatest universities. I am so proud of our work this year, which began a year ago with me standing here as your interim chancellor. The only thing I had achieved by that time was to develop the moniker I Chancellor. But I sought to remind all of us that we, the faculty, it was we who ultimately governed 
It was we who ultimately led. For that reason, despite the dramatic shift in leadership last year, we dedicated ourselves to those core values, teaching, research, and service. While our dedication to that craft, of course, occupied so much of the year, we also realized that to maintain our great progress, we had to actively and aggressively fashion new initiatives, rethink and expand our strategy, and recruit the very best, the very, very best new colleagues, diversely in all ranks. Indeed, I spent a large part of the beginning of last year when asked by department chairs, deans, and faculty colleagues about hiring. For some reason, I didn't have to deal with the provost during the interim year. Uh, they would ask me about hiring, you know, what are we going to do? My message was clear. Think boldly. Don't worry about how many can be hired. Don't bother me about at what rank. Ask only who are the very best people in the world who will add new exciting ideas and diversity to our academic community. And please, tell each one, we will guarantee that you will do your best work and thrive at Vanderbilt in Nashville. This was important for so many reasons, but signally, because as I say, the quality of the university is simply the ultimate, the quality of the faculty is simply the ultimate measurement of the university. Yet, we also were, I think, at a critical juncture in our university's history. We had, I believe, largely reversed the drain I saw so often as a young colleague in the 90s to other top universities, repeatedly and with rare exceptions, that often take a friend away to another university, we are now keeping our very best, and they are helping us recruit others. Even in the past year, when I had a colleague peek at other opportunities at other great universities, for there are many, I was so heartened to hear, you know what? We're better than they are. I think our department is stronger and more vital. Our collegiality and quality are way ahead of us. It doesn't snow here. <laughs> it was thus plain to all of us that this was a year to move. This was a year to be aggressive and move forward, to hire, to build, to do so without concerns about who sat in 211 Kirkland Hall. By any measure, this was a remarkable year on all fronts. I am so appreciative of all that you have done. I applaud your leadership. More importantly, I applaud your confidence in these uncertain times and your commitment to Vanderbilt, the institution, and to our mission. In a year that began with much uncertainty, and ends as we move forward into the next year. By every measure, our university is far stronger, more fixed on those values that for all of us deeply matter. Numbers tell only part of the picture, but they are important to our success, our strength, our pride. First, our undergraduate program is becoming one of the strongest in the nation. We received over 17,000 applications for our undergraduate class, a 31% increase, our largest in history. I expect that trend to continue. Our admit rate of 25% makes this our most selective year. This led to an enrollment class rich in diversity of all kinds, with an average SAT of 1,400, up 21 points, and an average class rank of the top 6%. There are 159 valedictorians, 179 National Merit Scholars, and a quarter of our undergraduates are now students of color. My goal, our goal, must be to bring to Vanderbilt to future leaders in science, literature, engineering, art, music, philosophy, and economics, every area that touches our humanity. That is the joy of teaching, to teach with and learn from the best in the classroom, but increasingly side by side with you, with your graduate students, in the research environment where discoveries are made. It is also critical to remember that every crane on this campus, every brick laid, every dream of building a new building in arts, engineering, biological sciences, a new hospital is based on, the, on this talented and remarkable group, group of youngsters. Vanderbilt has an enviable double bond rating, which gives it excellent access to credit markets, still at very low rates. Hardly something to be taken for granted as we look at the meltdowns of the financial giants and so-called pillars of American finance. A large part of that very high rating is based on the quality of these undergraduate students, the demand for this extraordinary undergraduate experience. 
defined not simply by the opening of this beautiful new special community called the Commons, but by the dedication, not just in the schools that teach undergraduates, but in all the schools to mentoring and teaching these bright youngsters who arrive as teens. So much of our future is bound up in that, and you deserve so much credit for your teaching, but also for your inclusion across the campus in your research. Our, research, our results in research divide all, define all fiscal and competitor trends. Overall, our research funding was up over 6%, with many of our peers declining. I say this with pride, but also concern, frustration, and deep disappointment. Our nation's progress, competitiveness, our social fabric, and the sustainable future depend on well-funded research and education. I think there's probably been some progress in Washington, D.C., led, I might mention, by our senators and key members of our Middle Tennessee congressional delegation. But we are still enduring a dismal period. Fiscal constraints, along with what many continue to see as an anti-science political culture, combined with constant political attacks and sensationalized media coverage of our great university, pose major challenges to all of us seeking support for research and education. It is stunning to me, stunning to me, that the meltdown of the great timeless names, General Motors, Ford, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, asking for government support, and indeed, the almost outright demise of those can't-lose franchise companies, Bear Stearns, Countrywide. Our national leaders still fail to see that we, with all of our shortcomings, with all we can do better, that we, the great research universities, public and private, are the enduring institutions that provide the innovations, the cures, the solutions, all at the same time, all at the same time, opening paths for countless young people and families from all backgrounds, from all backgrounds, to fulfill the American dream of a great education. I pledge to you to continue to speak out on your behalf to make our government leaders understand the vital importance of your work and what your colleagues do at our peer universities. We also beat trans as well in our philanthropy this year. Our overall fundraising was $167 million, eking out last year's 100, uh, eked out a gain over last year's $162 million. Now, of course, a little insight to realize that dramatic drops in stock markets, home values, oil prices, the weakness of the dollar, the tenuous nature of the current national and global economy, and oh yeah, there was an invasion of an old uh, uh, part of the former Soviet Union called Georgia. This makes it a challenging philanthropic environment. Yet just as investors find things to make investments in in these tough times, our friends, alumni, parents, foundations felt the excitement, the momentum, endorsed our unique values, our strategy, and the real possibilities for making a difference through their gifts of annual. The external environment continues to look grim, yet I am so pleased to tell you, so pleased, that this year, through the work of so many, Vanderbilt is doing phenomenally well, receiving in the last several weeks two gifts totaling $100 million. We are recruiting a new Vice Chancellor for Development and Alumni Relations. That person will add more to our team but we have not stood still. I have authorized substantial increases in the de development budget to add significant numbers of new gift officers immediately, particularly in our outstanding medical center, where our potential for growth is significant and Randy Farmer is leading. We will have a great year for the simple reason that your work and your story are so compelling. Our end of the year fiscal report, while still being put together, is strong and it's sound. Our healthcare system continues to do well. Its success further links in the public mind, discovery, innovation, compassion, excellence, and quality to the Vanderbilt name, wherever it appears. I am so grateful to Harry Jacobson for his leadership, his team, his astute, his expert stewarding of the medical center. It is nationally and locally 
a challenging environment in healthcare. The change sure to come. We are strong. We will be ready to continue and even accelerate our academic leadership in what currently consumes almost 20% of our GDP. I'm also grateful to Dean Jeff Walzer, our Interim Dean of Medicine, who has led our outstanding research efforts as Associate Vice Chancellor for Research. When Dean Gabby suddenly stepped down, I'm not sure quite where he went. Uh, <laughs> Jeff quickly stepped in as Interim Dean while also continuing his role leading our research efforts. Working with Provost Richard McCarty, with Harry, with Associate Provost Dennis Hall, and Tim McNamara, Jeff and the Medical Center team quickly designed and vetted our new plans for our Academic Venture Capital Fund too. He has made a significant difference with the outstanding Medical Center team in immediately and visibly knitting, knitting together the disparate elements of our great medical school in our outstanding Medical Center, basic sciences, clinical care, clinical research, education, and its important work with our top 15 hospital. Harry and Jeff and everyone at the Medical Center deserve our gratitude. Our faculty continue to garner tremendous recognition, and there are so many prizes, important appointments, elections to prestigious organizations, major grants, but I can only mention a few. Let me acknowledge Jennifer Peepold, Director of the Ingram Cancer Center, named by the President to the National Cancer Center Advisory Board. Carol Swain, appointed by the President to the NEH Council on the Humanities. Terry Dermody, Professor of Pediatrics was named a fellow in the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Dana Nelson, Gertrude Vanderbilt Professor of English, was elected to the Anti American Antiquarian Society. Mace Rothenberg, Professor of Medicine, was named one of the top eight cancer caregivers by the American Cancer Society. Robert Miller, Professor of Medicine, won the Humanism in Medicine Award by the AAMC. Randy Miller, Professor of Biomedical Informatics and One Medicine, won the Lindbergh Award for Innovation. Not to be outdone, Bill Stead, Professor of Biomedical Informatics and Medicine, won the Common Award for, uh, of Excellence by the American Medical Informatics Association. Donna Ford, Professor at Peabody, won the Distinguished Scholar Award from the National Association for Gifted Children. Our faculty at all ranks won many prestigious fellowships and grants, and some of them may not be here because they did so well, they got on leave. John Janicek, Associate Professor of Anthropology, awarded a Dumbarton Oaks Fellowship in our outstanding area of pre-Columbian studies. Antonis Rokas, uh, uh, and for your junior faculty in here, these are people that, some of these just arrived, and so uh, the trajectory is there, you never never be dismayed. I remember when Antonis arrived, he has received a prestigious, a prestigious Searle Scholars Award. Michael Best, Professor of uh, Chancellor Professor of History, won the Guggenheim and the ACS Fellowship. I think he lost to Belmont. Uh, Jay Bloom, <laughs> Assistant Professor of Art, ACS Fellowship. Stacy Kerwood, Assistant Professor of Afri African American Diaspora Studies, Woodrow Wilson Career Enhancement Fellowship for Junior Faculty. Barbara Hahn, Distinguished Professor of German, a Guggenheim Fellowship. Larry Isaac, Allison Schachter, Joy Cal uh, uh, Allison Schachter, NEH Fellowship, and Joy Calico of the Blair School, uh, um, ACS, ACLS Burkhardt Fellowship, and Howard Fellowship. Our distinguished faculty is made better this year by a number of important new colleagues who I might add bring prizes and distinction with them. Cheryl Coffin is the distinguished good pastor, professor of investigative pathology and vice chair for anatomic pathology, a leading authority on soft tissue pathology and pediatric surgical pathology. Bill Tansley will join us as an Ingram professor of cancer research and will co-lead the genomic maintenance program in the Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center. He is an award-winning investigator moving to Vanderbilt from Cold Springs Harbor. I want to sing single out outstanding work by our interim dean, Carolyn Devon, our new provost, Richard McCarty, and two departments in particular for their leadership and for outstanding recruiting this year. Liz Lundbeck, who joined us only two years ago and is now the new chair of history, led the department on a spectacular series of appointments in key areas of importance and strategy including Leora Halevi and Julia Cohn, also in Jewish studies and who work in the inter intersection between Islam and Judaism. Ole Movi in history of science and European and, cult and German studies, and Lauren Clay in modern European history. Peter Lake, who was brought here to be uh, Jonathan Land's uh, partner watching uh, uh, British soccer and uh, uh, distinguished university professor 
one of the most distinguished in the world in English religious history. We are so pleased to have Peter here. Sarah Igo in American intellectual history. It is worth noting that two of these recruits, Leor Halevi and Sarah Igo, brought along major book prizes, joining Roseanne Adderley, who came last year and has already won a major book prize. They and their department are stronger than ever. These are breathtaking appointments. I continue to believe, however, that we need to add significantly to our hiring Near, East, Near Eastern, Asian, and Islamic studies, with history, English, political science, and other departments participating in these areas where we must build. Political science deserves special recognition, making seven outstanding hires this year. I want to recognize uh, the chair, Neil Tate, and uh, senior, his senior colleague, colleagues, John Gear, uh, uh, for, for this leadership. They grew the size, distinction, and the diversity of this department. Key recruits, recruits include Carol Atkinson, who studies national security and international strategy. Cindy Cam, American politics and political psychology. Efren Perez, immigration, American culture and attitudes. Giacomo Chiozza, international relations, American world, and Dave Lewis in the American president and the executive branch. Liz Zeckmeister, comparative politics and Latin politics and Latin American political behavior, building on our strength led by Mitch Selkson and his colleagues. I would note that David Lewis, who joins us from the school in New Jersey, arrived with the news that he had won the very prestigious Herman Simon, Herbert Simon Award for the study of American bureaucracy. David will allow us to do tremendous things in the department and with our new Center for the American President and American Politics and with the law school as well. I could go on to mention so many others, and I'm sure some deans are frowning that I did not mention their schools, but across the university there were remarkable hires in Divinity, Law, Owen, Nursing, Engineering, Peabody and Blair, across the entire campus. I met recruited actively almost all these wonderful colleagues, and they're brilliant by all measure, but they eagerly joined us because of you and what you have done. Now let me talk about the year ahead. We've had a great year that just passed. And I want to talk about some initiatives largely shaped by you and my conversations with so many of you. But the important conversations occur at the school level among faculty, colleagues, and their departments, the centers, and the important places where faculty need to discuss and govern the university and stake out our new ground for the future. First, we have widely vetted our plans for the new Academic Venture Capital Fund. The deans, the provost, and the vice chancellor of health affairs have been instrumental in engaging you in what this next venture should look like. It will be different because, different because of what you have told us. We have put together a fund of $50 million to begin the process of award this year. Notices will go out in September and call for pre-proposals. The new initiative will be in addition to our established programs in the successful Discovery and Research Grant Scholars Program, which will be continuing. The only thing that we are still working on is what should be the name? I may give out a grant for that. Uh, we have learned that the term venture capital conjures up with some of our external constituencies, particularly foundations, an image that is so vivid and intense as to render the academic world world, almost invisible. I also worry about what our leaders in Washington, D.C. would say if they saw such a fund, too. That is ready to go forward. For interdisciplinary research involving humanities and non-quantitative social sciences, we'll be adding a new program and additional funding to our existing research star grant program to see research involving a small number of faculty members from different fields. I believe we have created, a, through the Academic Venture Capital Fund, a culture of collaboration and valuing of interdisciplinary work. We will add to and increase the research scholar program. In addition, among in our discussions with deans and the faculty in the humanities and social sciences, there has been enthusiasm for the discussed Vanderbilt Institute of Advanced Studies. It has confirmed our belief that such a new model of faculty engagement on release time joined by distinguished visitors can greatly advance our mission and the quality of faculty's intellectual life and growth. We made substantial progress in other areas that call for new and innovative disciplinary centers on the environment. Signaling the importance of faculty leadership, this new and well-funded initiative is already making tremendous progress because of the recruit recruitment of George Hornberger, distinguished university professor of engineering. George, a National Academy member, I welcome. He's already developed a number of NSF pre-proposals for major initiatives and is connecting across the campus. 
Fourth, thanks to Bob Dennis, Peter Beerhouse, Kip Vescuzzi, and other faculty leaders in healthcare and social sciences who are making progress in recruiting leadership to a new multidisciplinary center on healthcare medicine and social science. This new center will allow us to build on the outstanding path breaking work in our medical center and a remarkable progress in medicine, health, and society. I continue to believe strongly that Vanderbilt has, can, and must take a leadership position in the dramatic transformation of our healthcare system. Our healthcare costs on our budget went up 12% this year, and that was not a volume increase. It is going to bankrupt America. I also think this is an area where we as a nation, a state, and a region, by many measures, continue to lag in healthcare outcomes. We are poised to lead given our incredible strengths in basic and clinical research and with our initiatives that increasingly and shrewdly look at questions of early diagnosis using our strengths in genetics, imaging, proteomics, pharmacology, the basic sciences to develop personalized medicine that is more efficient and humane. Also, our grant activity fits very comfortably and impressively into these initiatives. We receive a number of grants in bioinformatics, genetics, to address many of the weaknesses of our healthcare system. I would want to point out that we are the leaders in a DNA uh, bank, a data bank with more than 50,000 DNA samples. We have been selected as the coordinator of a $20 million National Human Genome Research Institute. Finally, as I noted, our world-class informatics program continues to partner across the institution to draw support and much attention. Let's also hope that we can move medical care, medical records, and medical information out of the 19th century into the 21st century. The costs of doing so are enormous, not doing so are enormous. Our work on the healthcare initiative, the tremendous success of our Center for National Studies, and our thriving CURB Center now reveal a dramatic need for substantial investments in another direction, and that is in the social sciences. Our strength in the social sciences, as well as our com the compelling difference we can make in healthcare care and in the environment, will demand that we add substantial number of new faculty who partner with these new initiatives in diverse and innovative ways through the social sciences. I am pleased, very pleased, that the deans and the faculty have been excited and eager proceed on this. I think it's fair to say that our faculty recruitment, our student quality, our growth in funding, our investments in research, and our plans for, yes, more space, a new life sciences and technology engineering. We have a new librarian as well to begin the discussion of the library of the future. But much work needs to be done on our graduate programs. We have made phenomenal progress. More investments are being made and will be forthcoming. I can assure you of that. But I believe we also need to take stock of our progress. As Jenny mentioned, we need to formulate our plan for the next five years. But we also, before we invest, need to look carefully at our progress to date, our strategy, and the basic systems of recruiting, educating, and yes, graduating our PhD students. In all of this, however, we must continue strongly to discuss, discuss articulate, and advocate for a culture of grad graduate education. I look forward to Richard Riccardi, the provost, leading this effort. Finally, I want to return to the matter of our undergraduates. Last April, I think there's one thing that drew applause, I stated that Vanderbilt needed to go to a new financial aid plan with loans eliminated. It is so right for us to do, and strategically it is where we need to be to secure our progress for the future. It will place us among a very handful of schools, including Princeton and Davidson. Our studies have shown it is affordable. It will not take away from anything else we do, and it will be announced nationally next month. Also, while it's in infancy, it is clear that our choice, inspired and led by the faculty, to move to a college system, starting with the freshman commons, has set us on the right path. I am so thankful to those who worked for 10 years on this, building this remarkable community, and particularly thankful to your colleagues are living with 1,570 freshmen. <laughs> we have received a large naming gift for our next phase of this compelling academic initiative and fundraising 
on other colleges is going forward and is very promising. I think ideas come and go for education. How do we make it more efficient? What is timeless and increasingly scarce and I think is in danger is the preservation of core educational values. A community of students and faculty who engage in and out of the classroom in their passion for ideas, learning, and change. We must be one of a handful that stay on this path. In all of this, as your chancellor, but as your professor, what all knits us together is not just human capital, but social capital. I admire all of our faculty who are visible throughout the world, connecting to their colleagues, travel widely to present at conferences, testifying before Congress, executive branch agency, serving on national panels. This is our work, and this is how we often seek to be recognized. But I frequently worry that a great university is thought to be simply the sum total of the individual accomplishments of the individual faculty. For me as a professor, I want to be at a university where my best, smartest, and most enjoyable colleagues are found next door, down the hall, in the next building, or across the array for a richly diverse academic community. In our work on the AECF2, called by some now as our pioneer awards, the Commons, our new colleges, the new Vanderbilt Institute, our new interdisciplinary initiatives, our most important aggressive faculty recruiting and retention, what we are trying to do is build a home, a home for all of you where you have the support, the time, yes, the time, and a culture that assures the best discoveries, the best ideas, and yes, the best times are found here and not elsewhere. In doing that, I want to emphasize that as we build our social capital, we must always tend to those in our community in need. I was so inspired two years ago when Kathy Fuchs, the chair of the faculty senate, worked with me to improve our mental health and wellness of our students. We must now turn to our own colleagues, to our own community, to our own family. We're proud of our competitive spirits, our tireless effort to be the best, make the first discovery. This is what makes us faculty. But bear in mind that these natural forces in our academic community of competition, endless work, being the first, are now combined with increased stress, increased competition for grant renewal, in the face of shrinking budgets. To find a book publisher, for what is a fine book, but as university presses cut back on their publications. For more patients, yes, for our great healthcare enterprise, for our great healthcare physicians and nurses, but always chasing dwindling healthcare dollars for our needs. And in our community, there are too many who suffer from mental illnesses and these must be addressed with more compassion and care. And yes, as an academic institution, the very best science and the very best treatment. We simply must be more attentive to and connected with members of our community. It matters not what awards, prizes, and honors we share if we don't face up to need to improve in this area. Working with the Senate and with the Provost and Vice Chancellor for Health, Health Affairs, I will be appointing a committee to report to me on what steps we need to take to ensure that our community is one that reaches out to help, is not neglectful, does not punish or shame those who suffer from illnesses, whose seriousness and impact are discounted or indeed stigmatized, stigmatized by others in our society. Please, let's try to be the best and excellent in this area as well. I close for now knowing that I will not speak to you again until April, but I look forward to seeing many of you and working with you in the year ahead. I am very excited about the year. If I'm not available immediately, or I'm not responsive to emails or calls, please do know that I miss my time as a professor and wish my time with you were more frequent. Yet I am cognizant at all times that I have a job to do. My work is as chancellor, and it's defined. And like all jobs, it has a job description. It's truly an honor, and when I think of my work as your chancellor, I don't think of one where the work is one of prestige, privilege, or play, although I have to say the perks of the job, particularly the parking space, is one that I greatly enjoy. But I think my job is clear. I must help you recruit and retain your best colleagues. I must teach your students, as do you. I must listen to, develop, and ex help fund and ex execute plans with you. Your leadership, students' leadership, your deans, 
on what opportunities can be seized must be identified. Yes, I must raise money. I must be out on the road to fund your work, the difference you want to make, and the dreams you have. I must steward the university financially. I must protect it from undue risk and ensure its good reputation. And most importantly, I hope I can set the right tone with you, the tone the chancellor must set for academic integrity, hewing very tightly to our mission, and never making the success of Vanderbilt only a byproduct of our individual interests, but why we come to work on this glorious campus every day. I look forward to the year ahead, and thank you so much for your presence here today. Let's